Hi Renata, can you hear me? I can hear you, hi, I'm here. Oh, hi, hi, great. So uh, we are more than 100 people are here and uh, it's a great privilege for us uh, to meet you uh, through Skype. And, uh, 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 а вот там у тебя микрофончик, вот проводной я тебе говорил. Проводной микрофончик прямо лежит. Вот смотри где, Максим. Максим, вот, 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 молодец. Максим uh, is taking a mic to translate. Okay. Сейчас, одну минуточку, Олег представит своего друга и наставницу Ренату Мирес. Олег, я introduce you, Рената. Алло, здравствуйте. Меня зовут Олег Шмурин. Я хочу представить Ренату Мирес. Она ученица Карлоса Кустанеля, Фариды Дона Грау, Эшей Беляр и Тео Кус. Свое обучение она начала в 1998 году, то есть она продолжалась более 10 лет. И началось оно в магазине «Феникс» в Санта-Монике, штат Аризона, в Калифорнии. И сейчас продолжает обучение у «Кервокис». У Ренаты Мерез два образования. Первое образование – это она магистр английского языка в Калифорнийском государственном университете, в Новом Чане преподавала. Также она бакалав по биохимии в университете Купла и работала с известным психиатром и психологом Лиси Джаби. Сейчас Ильяна Мерес старший инструктор и ведущий одном совете, творческий директор Лявин. Лявин – это организация, которая создана в Кавасанкостанеле для популяризации хранения его знаний. Также Ильяна Мерес известна многим по первым видео на совете, и она состояла в команде а, вместе с Наимирес, а, в команде, которая адаптировала древние магические пасы и другие упражнения а, для того, чтобы преподавать в современной форме, в форме концепции. И это то, что сейчас преподается на семинаре. Спасибо большое, Олег. Ну, благодаря э, инициативе Олега у нас есть возможность сейчас э, с -с -с послушать Ренату и задать ей э, вопросы. Ты не подсвет, Максим? Uh, uh, I uh, appreciate uh, Alec initiative to connect uh, with you during this event. So thank sure. you so much. Uh, I see it's morning in California. It is morning in California, yes, yes. Is, Ma is Maxim ready? Yeah, yeah, Maxim is ready. And so we turn the off light here uh, since we are uh, screening uh, your, uh, our Skype sessions on big screen. Okay. okay. Well, can I begin by saying good evening to all of you, and I really appreciate this opportunity of uh, speaking about the teacher. I have been able to listen to part of your conference, and um, I can tell that you're an audience or collection of people who really have a deep understanding of his work. And so I wanted to begin my short story about um, some of my personal experiences with him, which might be interesting to you, and how he taught us his apprentices. And then afterwards, we're going to open it up to questions and answers. Yes, please. So, okay. Yes, so, um, my, I met Carlos Castaneda in 1988. And this was a, a time in my life when I was looking at a lot of spiritual schools, a lot of mystical schools, and I had, you know, tried meditation, and I had tried South American schools, and this kind of thing. And um, I, I think I, I'm one of the most unlikely apprentices there is of Carlos Castaneda, because one day my girlfriend, you know, calls me up in the evening and says, hey, you know, Carlos Castaneda is giving a lecture at the loop school. And so I said, well, sure, let's go. Let's go, I'll be there. So she and I are sitting in the bookstore, and in walks this seemingly unassuming man. He, he's kind of sh on the short side. He's very complex. He's kind of dark curly hair, etc. I think you've all seen the pictures of him. And, but yet his presence, his extreme presence, just completely fits through. And it was a small collection of people, maybe about 30 people. And he had the effect of completely silencing everybody in the audience. It was like everybody became transfixed on what he was saying and what he was explaining. And of course, he talked about his experiences with Don 
Khan and the Yaki Indians, et cetera, et cetera. And then after this lecture, he asked if anyone was interested in doing movement with him in the park that Saturday. So, you know, my girlfriend and I looked at each other and we go, sure, we signed our names, we put our phone number down. And so we went to the park and we were there with, again, maybe about 30 people and we were doing these movements. And I said, I had been to so many other spiritual schools, but when I did these movements, I had this incredible feeling of vitality come to me and this incredible alertness and this incredible focus. And I was just like, wow, is this what it feels like to be alive? Uh, and um, after that class, a lot of people came and asked Carlos questions. And um, I, my girlfriend and I were rather shy, and then he kind of motioned over to us at the end when uh, everybody else had been down. And he, uh, he said to me, and he goes, he goes, I'm, he goes, I can see your energy, and, and he goes, look like you've had a lot of wear and tear in your life. Your energy is very low. You're at a low point. He goes, would you like to come to some of my future classes and, um, you know, help store your energy? So, of course, we saw, I said yes. My girlfriend and I were invited to, <coughs> excuse me, his other classes, which, of course, had Carol Tiggs and Florida Donna Grau and Taisha Avalar and the Blue Scout, et cetera, et cetera, and himself and a couple other people that I hadn't quite known yet. But that's, um, that's pretty much my introduction to him. Now, a lot of people are interested in how he taught and what he taught, because I think we all assume from reading his books that um, he might have taught like Don Juan, like he would sit next to us for hours and tell us the mysteries of the universe, you know. <laughs> and that was kind of what we were expecting, you know, and it was very, very different. Um, he would tell us that, you know, he goes, he goes, he goes, I've written so many mysteries and I've written so many stories in these books. He goes, if you want more stories, if you want more how the energy of the rolling fours, how the energy of the earth works, how the energy of the stars, and he goes, go read the books. He goes, but at this point in my life, because he knew that it, his end was coming. And he would always tell us, he says, it's one minute to 12, well, one minute to 12, one minute to midnight. Meaning midnight was so um, he was really interested in people who were going to do his work and doing the work and in experiencing his work physically and themselves that they would then have knowledge, have knowledge of his work. So this was the approach. It was a very action-oriented, doing-oriented kind of thing. And uh, so it was a grand departure from the way he had taught maybe some of his older apprentices that had come before us, whom he had lectured with and told stories to. This last group, which I was in, it was like we were the action figures, okay? So um, the first thing that he noticed about us was that we had very little energy, very little awareness, you would say, very little um, um, consciousness. And so he realized that in order for us to be able to understand the concepts of which he was speaking, to deeply hold on to them, that we need an extra, a different kind of energy than the normal energy of everyday life. So therefore, he, um, he, Carol Tiggs, thought, well, why don't we teach all these people in this classroom, you know, your students, these movements, these movements one had taught them, but which they had not really focused on so much before. So, you know, we had these classes of movements and we felt, oh my gosh, you, mean, you felt like, like you were, I'm sorry, you felt like you were 19 years old at the end of those classes, you know, just kind of floated out, you know, on these movements. And, um, then um, the, another practice which we had was, I think you've, you've probably talked about in your seminar, is the recapitulation. And that is, you know, the, the, the list of everyone you know, and you know, sitting down, remembering everybody you know, and breathing in the energy, so you, the energy returns back to you. And what's left then is just this, this tiny little shell of a memory. Yes, you have memories, but they don't, they don't hold you, they don't attach to you. And they don't move you to that nostalgia or that emotional content anymore. They're just, they just become replete of emotional content. 
And um, this was, yes, the way of, of, of erasing personal history. And so we all did this. Yeah. Carlos was very keen on trying to mirror some of the things with us that Don Juan had done to him. And so there was this, this, this thing that Don Juan did to him. And that was, um, you know, Carlos would go down to Mexico and visit Don Juan for a couple of weeks. And he'd come back to Los Angeles. And, you know, he'd be this, this college student and everything. He was for a couple of months. And Carlos would have to do his homework. You know, he'd have to do his own movement. He'd have to do his own recapitulation, et cetera, or whatever the teachings Don Juan told him to do. And then he'd go back to Mexico for more teachings. And, um, and so when Carlos would return to visit Don Juan, you know, Carlos would tell Don Juan all the stories of his recapitulation. You know, the, the many, many times he was married, many, many times he was in love, many, many times of, you know, his childhood and his, his time in Los Angeles, etc. And Don Juan then would make jokes about it. And, you know, went from Gorda and Nestor and Pablito, etc. And the little sisters, you know, he would just, he would tell all these stories of all these stories about Carlos Castaneda's past and everybody would be, would be laughing and Carlos would be standing feeling like he's two inches tall but uh, this was a way in that tradition to lose um, self-importance but it this was the idea that if anything could be told about you negatively then um, you know, and, and you could be unemotional about it, that was the place to go. So, of course, this was tried on me, you know. You know I may have attended maybe, you know, maybe 10 classes with Carlos and his group, and, um, and I had been recapitulating very fiercely every night. I'm kind of a, when I, when I, I'm kind of a person, when I find something I love, and it truly did speak to me, that I really do it. So, um, and then, so I'm walking into class, extremely okay, unassuming, and Carlos then, he, he would call me every morning at about 7 o'clock before I went to work, and he goes, children, tell me what you recapitulated, tell me what you learned, tell me what you saw. And so I, I down, you know, and, um, and so I walk into this class, and he, he starts telling the stories of my life to everybody there. And just like he had felt with Don Juan, I felt too tall. And everybody in the room was laughing because we all know that Carlos can, can tell any story perfectly. You know? And I have to say that my self importance was so large that um, uh, the first couple times this happened to me, and it happened many, many times, that I had to run very fast to the restroom because I had complete diarrhea. Everything was. Out. Everything, all my self-importance was coming out. So, um, so that that was another way of, of Carlos's kind of teaching us and getting rid of this this personal history and this identity of of I'm just one way. I'm just the one way that my parents taught me to be, or the one way that I was socialized. Um, other th ways that he would teach us was he would invite small groups of us over to his house. And we would do extremely or seemingly mundane things. Uh, we would break leaves in the yard. We would, um, uh, how do you say it? He, he was, uh, he would, before he, before he was Carlos Castaneda, he, um, he was a sculptor. He was an artist with his hands. So he was very good hand. And so he, um, in his later years, he turned that into carpentry. And so we'd go over to his house and we would make these tool sheds, we'd make these benches, or we would make these shelving for the library of the house. It's like the house, his house in which he lived with um, Taisha and Florin and Carol, was always in evolution. Just like he is, he's always growing, he was always changing. So we would go over on the weekends in small groups and we'd, you know, he'd give us, uh, you know, we would help him construct things around the house. And this was, again, a very unusual experience because, you know, it was, he gave very little direction and we, we mimicked him. We did what he did. We, and this is how we assembled things. And we really were asked at a very deep and, and maybe unconscious level or subconscious level to really mimic his mood. And his mood was one of extreme silence, there was no interior dialogue except that of the project. This project was the first 
and the last and the most important thing uh, in his life. This was everything. And so in this way, he really learns how to be in the present moment and how to put everything we have into now. And, uh, because, you know, internal dialogue, you're not judging anything, you're not holding anything back, you're just in the moment. Everything is, is very real. So, um, then there were other times because I think another part of the teachings was the dreaming. And this is, in our tradition, we dream, and we dream asleep in the sense that dreaming for us is a shift of perception from ordinary reality not to non-ordinary reality or heightened awareness, however you would call it. And um, he would always tell us, he'd say, you know, oh, um, he goes, when you have enough energy, when you have enough energy for movements, when you have enough energy from the recapitulation, when you have enough energy to return back to you, you will be able to dream quite, you know, on phone. Um, but in order for us to kind of, you know, start this, start this for ourselves, you would take us on, I think you would call trips. Trips. Um, kind of, you know, different hours of the night, you know, say around two at two o'clock in the night, he'd call a couple of us and he says, you know, Chola, come over, come over, we're going, we're going to go for a drive, okay? He'd always use the excuse, he goes, oh, Florinda needs something, Florinda needs something. And I go, okay, two o'clock in the morning, sure, I'm there. So, you know, myself and a couple others, we all pile onto his truck, and he had this little beige pickup truck, and he drove, you know, he's behind the wheel, you know. He's kind of a short man, so his, this wheel is really good. And, um, and we're driving through these streets of Los Angeles, and you know, we kind of know where we're going, but all of a sudden things start looking very strange. They don't, they don't look recognizable anymore. And we go over, we drive over a stone bridge, and then Carlos stops in front of what looks like from the exterior uh, as a dance hall. And, um, you know, and all these people are standing in line, all these people are coming and going, and there's a lot of light, and there's a lot of noise, and lots of music coming from this place. And he, he goes, he goes, look inside. When I drive by, look inside and see. And so we all, you know, we drive by, really, we all look inside. There's all these lights, and there's all these people dancing and having a whole lot of fun, okay? And then, and then he just drives away, and he goes, he goes, well, we, we, we got what Florinda wanted, and so let's go back. So um, we, we would then go back home, and then some of us the next day would want to come. Let's try to find this place ourselves. You know what I mean? And, um, and so, you know, we get in our car, and the next, you know, just us apprentices, we, we drive through the streets, we drive the bridge, and we're here. We're here. And this was what was there the next morning was a dilapidated old building that had been for 20 or 30 years. And it had an old sign hanging off of it. You know, an old sign, which is the night before, it says Virginia's. And the morning after, it was this old sign hanging. It had all the letters were all eradicated, and you might have had a V, a first big V. And um, so we just we just go, oops, you know, let, let's just go back home and never never mention this again, you know. And, um, and so we, we knew then that um, that we had been on a trip, on a, you know, and we were doing these excursions or having all of these paranormal experiences. Substance. I think everyone is familiar that in the first probably two or three books, Carlos was in Substances by Don Juan for various reasons. And then afterwards, he was, he was no longer using substances. And, um, you know, Taisha and Florinda and Carol were not given substances, and, not, and neither were any of us. And we were able to have these paranormal experiences simply by doing the tools of this amazing lineage. And um, so, these kinds of, we were kind of all engaged in this, and um, this was going on until about 1993. And, um, you know, Carlos and Carol were very impressed with how these movements changed us and how they gave us all this parent um, energy. And so we said, well, gosh, why, why don't we expand this to other people? Why don't we take this to more public venue? 
Um, because Carlos, as you know, had written all these books. He had, you know, he had uh, educated the population or brought his work out in his books. Only. But he, again, he, by this time of his life, he wanted something practical. He wanted to leave. He wanted to die knowing that someone or some group of people was doing his work. And he was Wall. He wasn't going to be, you know, start a small grand group of people that would then have another small group of people. That's not what he knew that. But he, he thought that this work was so precious to him, was such a gift, that he really wanted to give to the world. So in 1993, he started having seminars in which, you know, in Northern California, you know, small ones, 30 people, and they grow up to 100 people, etc. And um, then, you know, he opened up Clear Green in 1995, the company that still exists, seminars currently. And um, that's, you know, and he started, he titled all of this Tensegrity, which is really, when you look at the term of Buck, Mr. Fuller, it's about the interlinking and the interconnectivity of natural systems. And what, what he liked about that was, it was that when he was watching us, when he was leading us in those movement sessions, he could see that each one of us, because we were doing these movements of this lineage, were actually connected to each other. And he realized that this would be our strength, that the people that followed him doing this, actually doing this work, that would be their strength, is because they would be connected to each other in these very mystical and energetic way. So he therefore called his work, or his, you know, his work to the public on um, consegrity, which very, very much is we, you know, us teaching it today, we try to give it as seamlessly and as as a mirror of the way we were taught ourselves. So, um, right. So I think you know, I think it's summing up. Um, what Carlos Castaneda gave. I mean, he gave me personal things and he gave things to the world. Um, you see, he, he believed my own experience, and so therefore it was outside of the realm of belief. We only believe when it has not been proven. But he proved by his own experience that each and every human being had this possibility of, of reaching through the methods of the ancient seers to this other side of themselves. Mm. To this other mm. side of themselves mm. is, is energetically connected to everything in the world. That is the piece of us that reads energy, um, called it the energy body. Um, that, and, is, and that we can all reach that, this state. We can all reach this other piece of ourselves. And he used to have this story about um, a, a man who had this big keg of water on his back and he goes, he goes, humanity is like a is like a man, a thirsty man walking in the desert with a big keg of water on his back. And um, the man, you know, who's thirsty doesn't realize there's a keg of water. And he goes, that's like all of us. We don't know we have an energy body. We don't know that we live first in this world, this very physical world, um, with in the terms of energy first, and then the layer of physicality and the layer of all of our five senses is laid in on top of that. He goes, you don't realize that. And he goes, what sincerity does to that man in the desert is he takes, you know, takes the keg off and he starts drinking the water. He starts being nourished by this. And so when one does the tools of tensegrity, um, this is what one feels. One feels extremely rejuvenated. Like I said before, your mind is extremely clear and focused. You know, just like focusing on that library, you know, that like making that library bench, just like focusing on writing a book, whatever. Extreme focus. Um, from the recapitulation, a person gets this um, balance of your emotions. You know, things happen in your life, and yes, good and bad things, if you to judge them, happen in your life. But you're not in emotional turmoil over them. They're happening, you're dealing with them, and life goes on. And then, um, you know, so mind clear, emotions stable, and um, body extremely fit. Um, I, I think everyone... I'm only going to speak about Carlos, but um, it, how old he was or, or, or how old he was not was always a question because um, the doing of this work makes you look years, years, years younger than what you really are. Um,
So I, I think I agree with um, a lot of you, uh, and I personally feel that Carlos Castaneda gave such a tremendous gift to this world. And um, he opened up the doors to what he called the second attention, the, the other realms of, of the onion, the other layers of the onion, for all of us with these tools to go and pursue, bruise, and to, because that's really, you know, our birthright. So, um, you know, but maybe we open up a time now for questions. Is, yes. is that what I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, I think it's time for a uh, question uh, now. Thank you so much, Rimi, again for being with us and for this great uh, introduction mm -hmm. into your experience with Carlos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Да, пожалуйста, сюда подходите, чтобы можно было с микрофоном. Вот, вот там микрофончик на столе лежит. Вот, на, на, нет, вот на столе лежит, да. О, очень коротко и по сути. Один вопрос. Задавайте. А я постараюсь ответить. Меня зовут Аня. Я хотел бы узнать... Тот микрофон, потому что вы это там не слышите. Я хотел узнать, что Карл Сканет говорил о количестве времени и как команда so uh, my name is Amir and I would like to know uh, what Carlos Castaneda said about um, the will of time and how the will of time influences uh, the human body and the human life. Thank you. So I, I heard very little of that in English. The, the question was about the will of time and how it influences the uh, human body. The wheel of time and how it influenced the human body, correct? Okay, so um, I think you're probably getting that concept from his book, The Wheel of Time. And the wheel of time is a state that one reaches when one is in dreaming. And when you enter that dream space, and for many times when you're a little more sophisticated dreamer, you will see a corridor, or you will see a circular space and you will see a corridor or this circular space with lots of doorways, lots of channels, lots and lots and lots of opportunities. And um, this, and then you, and you realize that, oh my gosh, you know, perception is multiple. You know what I mean? That we are, because of our, because we're, we're, we're how do you say it, raised very physically and we're socialized very physically, we, have, we are just looking down one little channel, but yet there's all of these channels to actually explore with our perception, with our expanded awareness. So the question is, how does this affect the body? Um, and I would think I would expand that question to how does dreaming affect the body? How does dreaming awake, dreaming sleep affect the body? Because this is an act of dreaming awake or dreaming sleep. And um, dreaming, okay, when you're in dreaming, if, um, okay, I mean, okay, so when you're, when you're in dreaming, you, you're with your energy body. In our tradition, we call that when we enter the dream space, whether it's waking or sleeping, our energy body is the one that is with us then. Our energy body is the one that's seeing, feeling, and sensing this new, this new energetic environment, which in normal awareness we don't usually have. And so the body physically feels like it has all of its energy, finally. You know, you've been around most of your life with just maybe half of your energy. But when you're in these spaces, you feel, you feel your energy body. You, um, yes, you have a physical body skill, but so much of your awareness is with your energy body that you actually feel like you're starting to vibrate, like you are your energy body, that this is you know, that, that you have this uh, vib vibratory awareness and this vibratory awareness will allow you to go through all these multiple doorways. If you're asking if people can be healed by this, because again, I'm trying to assume some of the questions you may ask. I mean, if, Carl, if, if a person is able to sustain by their will to reach their energy body and over after a period of time of doing this work you will be able to do that then you'll be able to use that energy to heal the physical form okay uh, 
the case, the most dramatic case in point was we all know that Carlos um, had liver cancer these last last years of his life. And he was an absolute master in being able to have enough energy to give his apprentices enough energy to write another four or five books, enough energy and enough energy to heal himself. Anyway. Because um, and again, he knew he was, he was he was dying. He knew he, his trip to infinity was come really soon, so he had to save enough energy for that. So, um, but every time he went to the doctors, he, he'd go to the doctors and they'd do all this blood work, you know, and the blood work would show, you don't have liver cancer, everything's normal, completely normal numbers. But then when they did like biopsies, they go, oh yes. Because, you know, so, um, so he had been able, even though he was doing all these many different varieties of things with his energy this way, he was able to use the energy from his energy body to regulate his physical form. Now, um, the, 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 would take some practice. <laughs> oh, yeah, really. Thank you so much. Next question. Next question. No, microphone. Uh, good morning. We have many people who believe that uh, tensiogrity practice is not effective. At, at the same time, they are practicing tensiogrity. They are practicing tensiogrity. Why do, can you comment on this? Yes. Um, so, yes. So, yeah. So people are practicing tensegrity and people might not find it effective. I know that there are different groups of people who, was that the end of the question? Oh, okay. Oh, there's different groups of people who call themselves as practicing tensegrity. Um, and there's people who read the books and then practice tensegrity kind of by themselves, reading from reading these books. And that, that's a way of practicing tensegrity. And then there's other people that would attend the seminars and um, then they practice tensegrity through following the seminars. And um, what's what I have found from people who have practiced tensegrity uh, from merely yeah, reading the uh, books uh, is that those books are really hard to interpret for a normal person. Uh, and uh, they bring a lot of ma mixed or mass interpretations to them. Uh, and, you know, this is the reason why, you know, the seminars began yeah. was because we, we were taught to interpret all, the, all those stories. What does all this mean? Why is it practical? Why do you want to do it? Let's do it. Um, so, I, I, I am very familiar with people that come to the seminar, they feel affected by it, they do have that euphoria state, they do see changes of experience in their lives, um, and it's very rare that maybe one or two people in the audience, rare though, doesn't get affected, doesn't have this feeling. Uh, and tensegrity, because it has so many pieces, it, like I said, it's, it's more than the movements. You really have to do the recapitulation. And a lot of people do the movements and don't do the recapitulation. And therefore, what happens then is if you're just doing the movements, you're, you're getting to your energy body and it tends to, to come to you and it tends to, to uh, how you say it, almost enhance your current ego. And, um, and so you really need to do the, the recapitulation and erase that personal history because then you'll be empty. And so when you do those movements and your magical passes and your energy body comes over you, then it'll stay, it'll stay because you have kind of, you're empty and it has something to fill in you. So, I think that the question of some people do tensegrity and you really have to dissect that question a little bit. And that's what I tried to do here. And that, you know, I think, and to get the full benefits out of tensegrity, one really has to do the full package. Don't, I would suggest, don't try to don't just pick one favorite piece of yours and do that.